Welcome to the Hidden Philanthropist podcast, proudly presented by the Purdy Foundation. Join us as we uncover the art of giving back. Hey listeners, I can't tell you how privileged I feel to talk to today's guest, one of Australia's national living treasures. He's been a driving force in public and community services for decades now, and his philanthropic efforts have inspired a generation. He's been awarded and lauded for his contribution to social justice, health and welfare issues and international development assistance, particularly during his many years with World Vision Australia. Welcome, Reverend Tim Costello. So start off with a little bit of recognition for you. 1997, you were named as one of Australia's 100 National Living Treasures. From 2003 till 2016, you were CEO of World Vision Australia, following being appointed by Chief Advocate after that. You were named 2004 Victorian of the Year in recognition for your years of public and community service. 2005, you were made Order of Australia. 2006, you were named Victorian Australia of the Year. 2008, you were received an honorary doctorate from the Australian Catholic University. 2008, winner of the Australian Peace Prize. And again, 2014, the National Trust Poll had you as one of Australia's national living treasures. Welcome to the Hidden Philanthropist, Reverend <laughs> Tim Costello. I feel like I'm at my funeral. You're doing a eulogy. <laughs> I like to give people a bit of recognition on the intro, but I've got to say today, there hasn't been one that's gone on that long. You've certainly <laughs> had a celebrated career. Your passion and energy in life is extraordinary. Winding the clock back, were you always so driven to succeed? What was life like for a young Tim Costello? No, not driven to succeed at all. My only ambition back then was to play football for Essendon. And now at the age of 67, I don't think I'm going to put myself in the draft for Essendon. I don't think that ambition will ever be achieved. You're not going to make the 2023 (laughs) draft, you don't think? I don't think I'm going to. Now, I grew up in um, Leafy, Blackburn. My parents carved block and built a three-bedroom weatherboard house out of the orchards of Blackburn, which was all orchards back then. Every kid I knew was sort of a white Australian who could drop kick a footy and ate a meat pie. The only see, a foreign-sounding name was Barassi. He used to play for Melbourne, and that sounded a bit exotic, but it was homogeneous. It was, you'd say, Middle class, maybe lower middle class. My brother and I shared a bedroom for the first 16, 17 years of our lives. We were happy kids, but not ambitious. We didn't know captains of industry or media people or influential people. We were suburban kids in Main Street, Blackburn. Strange that you say that neither of you are overambitious because you've both gone on to have really decorated careers in your own fields, haven't you? We have. And look, it is not just a bit of a mystery. It's a mystery to my mum at one point. When Peter and I were, I guess, at the height of our powers, he as federal treasurer, me doing what I was doing, she pulled me aside and with great wonderment, she said, Tim, what happened in this family? Your father and I are just ordinary people. We're just teachers. What is going on here? So I think that actually expresses how we all felt. It wasn't a sense that were well connected or moneyed or set up to achieve. But clearly there was something in the water also that that happened. And what did you answer to your mother's question? What had happened? You went on to study law at university. How did it all unravel? Well, I don't know how to answer my mum's question other than to say she was a teacher in the state system. Dad was a teacher in the private system. He taught his whole career at Cary where Peter and I went. So we wouldn't have been able to afford private school fees. We got there because Dad was a teacher and you didn't pay fees. (laughs) And there we did mix with kids who was a boys' school then who were sons of corporate chiefs and others. But I think both parents as teachers had this wonderful curiosity for life. They were innate born teachers. Meal times, and I thought all families were like this, would go for a couple of hours. I remember at age 10 or 11 having a friend over to our Sunday lunch and our friend saying, your family's so weird. And I said, why? We eat our dinner and we go and watch world championship wrestling or kick the footy. You sit there for two hours and you debate and discuss. I actually thought that's what families did because that's what my parents brought us up doing. So I think I put it down to people who 
in my parents were curious, had a love of learning, and as educationalists knew how to draw out the best in their kids. And I think it doesn't take much diving into the media to read that faith is one of your foundations. Was that something you found later in life or was that part of your life growing up? Very much part of our life growing up. So dad would take us to the boys, to the football at Essendon. And back then it was the VFL, 12 teams, the 12 tribes of Melbourne played each other. Then dad and mum would take us on Sunday to church and we'd learn about the 12 tribes of Israel and the Christian faith of Jesus coming from one of those. I remember thinking the symmetry of life is 12. Saturday is football. Sunday it's chosen people children of Israel and faith. So Sunday school church was very much part of it. And I do credit church. I think early on, both Peter and I, and this happens still today in churches, were given opportunities to stand up and speak, to lead, to gain confidence in skills. And those are transportable skills to business, to politics, to media. When you think of so many of our great musicians all basically started in church from Elvis to Michael Jackson to Guy Sebastian. It's the same principle. There is this remarkable community that meets week by week, has a morally serious topic, we call it a sermon, passes around the plate, not just for their needs, but for the needs of their community and others, and imparts skills, trains you in speaking, in singing, in leading. I do credit that. Yeah, and all of those things that the church taught you that enabled you to deliver throughout your career. Obviously, a lot of your philanthropic attitude and view on things has been derived from what you've learned through faith. Was it always going to be that way? Because I said you went off to law and did it. You went off to uni and did a law degree. Mm -hmm. Was it always going to be a path of philanthropic work or was that something that came later? Yeah, so it was through faith and through that community it bred into us. Mum would always have extra seats at the table for what she called Tim's strays. And they were kids from the local orphanage or people who missed out. And we'd always be including people and feeding them. And that was just the sense that happiness in life actually comes through serving. Kierkegaard put it nicely. He said, the door to happiness turns outwards. People who are obsessed with themselves and their own happiness are often miserable. People not seeking happiness, but actually serving and thinking of others, find as a byproduct happiness. I think that faith position was very, very true in shaping us. Uh, Look, Law, mum's brother uh, was a barrister, Uncle Ray, and Law, when I got into it at Monash, sort of had a sense, well, that would be doing justice. More it had a sense of, it's the longest degree and I don't want to work. (laughs) Uh, And in fact, I did a law degree and then I still didn't want to work. I got articles, but I went and did a diploma of education at Dip Ed. So I did six years. I really loved university. I just loved hanging out and discussing and debating. Six weeks of teacher training in the classroom in my Dip Ed Convince me law was a very good idea. (laughs) It's really hard to discipline kids and and control them. So I then practiced law for 15 years. I learned in law, it's more about time costing billing than justice. So after I'd gone to Switzerland and studied theology, I set up a poverty law practice in the church at St Kilda for the poor. And I was happiest there because that justice sense of why I did law was actually being truly expressed. Didn't make any money, but I actually felt really happy doing it. Yeah. And what triggered you to go over to Switzerland with Meridi to do that? So I'd been doing criminal and family law before I went to Switzerland, and I was getting discouraged. Family law is pretty sad. People who once loved each other are scratching each other's eyes out over custody, over the kids, over the house. I was a defence lawyer. The crims I represented were always repentant outside of court on the steps and you know you keep them out of jail often not always and they'd always go back to crime and there was this sense of "Hmm, am I really helping here so I actually went and studied uh, theology not to be a minister but to be a better lawyer to actually go what the roots of justice where does transformation real lasting change come from not just transactional client-based stuff 
And that's why when I came back, a little church in St Kilda that virtually died, had less than 10 members, are all in their 80s, said, if you'll be the minister and speak on Sundays, they couldn't pay me, we'll let you set up a law practice. I thought that was a great deal because I actually was more motivated about being a good lawyer and pursuing justice than at that point the ministry. They literally came along and said, we've never had an ordained minister. You've done the theology. You could be ordained. In many ways, I got ordained because it meant a lot to them. I've always, even now, the reverend in front of my name, I go, well, yeah, was I really just called to holy orders? Probably not. I was called to practicing justice, community building, and that old congregation wanted a reverend, and then they've been kind letting me set up a law practice in the church. It was sort of interesting how I thought about that, particularly when I'd be one of the best-known reverends in Australia, but always it sits a little bit uncomfortably with me because there are people who really had a very clear calling from God to holy orders. It was never quite my story. So two amazing things happen today. One is I get to speak with you, and secondly, I get to speak to a lawyer whose main focus is on billable hours. I don't think that'll ever happen in my life again. Come back from Switzerland. Was that Urban Seed that you were talking about? Uh, No, that was St Kilda, where we were for 10 years, and in that church it grew. We bought a house, a Macassar house, for runaway kids. Uh, St Kilda was the magnet area for runaway kids, for street workers, people with mental health. We took over special comms and did them up and cared for mentally ill. So St Kilda for 10 years. I ended up mayor of St Kilda. I was running on a platform of putting ratepayers' dollars into social housing. We had such homelessness rising in St Kilda and got elected. We were uh, the first council to actually put ratepayers' dollars into social housing. Today, St Kilda has 12% of all its housing stock. That's social housing. Melbourne has less than 4%. Why do we have so much homelessness? We just haven't invested in social housing. And so I was very proud of that. Urban Seed was the next chapter when I went to Collins Street Baptist after finishing up as Mayor of St Kilda. What was the most rewarding thing that you achieved in your time there at St Kilda? Because I want to talk next about going on to one of your, probably your highest profile position, which was CEO of World Vision Australia. But when you were here and you were back in St Kilda at the absolute coalface of our local problems, what was the greatest challenge and what was the greatest reward? I think the greatest reward was building a community out of that church that was inclusive. You had sex workers, you had people who were gay and had been hurt by the church, you felt welcomed, you had professionals, you had people from the boarding houses, the special accoms who struggled with mental health. And we would have these monthly, you wouldn't call this name today, but we called them love feasts back then. They were just parties, basically, of acceptance of food, maybe a dress-up theme. People of totally radically different backgrounds who would never socialise together. And I think building a community that was that inclusive and had the church's motto was committed at the core, open at the edges. So we knew what we were on about. We had a commitment at the core, but it were very, very open at the edges and built a very inclusive community. And moving on from there, to look back now, how our streets of St Kilda and in fact across our state and across our country We still have such issues with homelessness and underprivileged and lack of opportunity with education and in families living under the poverty line. Has a lot changed since back then? I mean, have we progressed? Uh, No, it's ebb and flow. We've progressed in some areas. I was there in St Kilda when we closed down the psych institutions, which were cold, alien and terrible. We didn't put enough money into the community-based institutions. That's why at St Kilda we got involved in taking over special comms and actually bringing them up to standard because people were expelled from psych institutions and really thrown out on the streets. But it was a progress to say, no, those cold psych institutions are inhuman and we must be able to do better. I think we've progressed in saying, actually, we have to address social housing. We now know it's not a mystery why we have so much homelessness. We can't go on just saying they're stupid or lazy or didn't work hard. And my success is my own doing. Their failure is their own fault. I think we have actually started to blunt that harsh attitude. 
In other respects, we still have homelessness when we know what we should be doing. We still have a range of attitudes that are harsh. I've spoken out about our attitudes to refugees. It's one step forward, two steps back. It's a mixed picture. Yeah, and there's some people out there within our society that, like yourself, that do amazing things. One thing I always promise about on our podcast is never talk about politics. I never want to get political, but I am today. Do you think that as a government we're doing enough to address homelessness and social housing? No, we've failed terribly. When you think that the Scandinavian countries have 20% of their housing stock that's social housing and they actually don't have homelessness. When you think that there are measures a wealthy country could have taken, we've seen federal and state buck passing, which is why I ran as mayor and got elected on a social housing platform because the buck passing between state and feds just goes on, not our responsibility. We've seen profound failure there and have descended often into the tired old stereotypes of scapegoating and blaming rather than real solutions. I'm talking now in years, 1990, 2000. What time were you back there as Mayor of St Kilda? I was Mayor in 1994, 1993, 94. I was only Mayor for a year because council amalgamations occurred and all councils were dissolved. But that push with others, it was called Turn the Tide to actually invest in social housing, had been happening for over five years. That program of social housing is still happening in now Port Phillip, which is the replacement of the Council of St Kilda. So I'm really proud that goes on. The reason I want to make a point of that is nearly 30 years have gone past. There was such a huge problem with it back then, and now it only seems to be rearing its head on a political agenda where they are starting to push social housing. And we're seeing that now through private enterprise where government is trying to encourage public participants and private participants to get into the field and address it, but it seems like very little's been done for a very long time. Totally. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, we did something locally in St Kilda, and I remember as me going up and speaking to South Sydney Council then, and they were going to step up and do something, but it was all piecemeal because of this buck passing between state and feds. And there never seemed to be votes in social housing, or we always said, oh, too difficult. It's fascinating to me when COVID hit, and suddenly we realised that people who are homeless were part of our community. An invisible virus, biological virus, showed us we were connected, and we got them into hotels, (laughs) and we got them into safety, and we said, oh, we can do this, when we were at risk. Yeah, that buck passing and sort of nonsense that says, you know, oh, well, it sounds like socialism, social housing, therefore we won't do it. That political problem has continued. So from your time in St Kilda where you're doing amazing things to then probably stepping up to, like I said, the height of your philanthropic journey when you were CEO of World Vision Australia, I mean, that's a very serious position. How did that come about? Well, I was tapped on the shoulder by the headhunter looking for a CEO. I initially said no, and it's my wife who said, look, you've been here at Common Street running Urban Seed, which is a great ministry with CBDs, urban poor and drug affected, uh, banging on about gambling. She said, you're banging on so much, I'm getting bored. Maybe you need a change. So she prompted me to actually go to an interview and World Vision hired me. Look, it was a very big step up because suddenly, you know, Urban Seed that I've been running for 10 years was 20 staff. World Vision was 600 staff. Urban Seed was smell of an oil rag. World Vision was 400 million a year business and turnover. So I hurriedly started reading books on management. I must admit I got bored, glazed eyed, or throw them over my shoulder. (laughs) But I think I had a talent for picking good managers, good execs. I saw myself as a leader, not a manager, as a CEO to be the morale booster, to be the chief salesperson for World Vision, to be the person who also gave clarity of vision, casting the vision, but I wasn't a manager. I think we had good execs and over those years chose good execs who were good managers. Yeah, How did you go transitioning from channeling all of your energy into local domestic issues? And like you said, 20 staff, you're at the cold face mm. of the problem. You've got ultimate control to then 
having to get your head around such massive global international issues. And like you said, 400 million, 600 staff. Was that a challenge for you? It was a huge step up for me. Look, on the international issues, I'd always read and I was across a lot of the challenges of global poverty. I'd been on the board of another international aid agency. I started in my St Kilda years, went through my Collins Street Urban Seed years. So I knew those challenges. The business challenges of running a big business was actually the huge step. And my wife (laughs) reminds me that after my first week at World Vision as CEO, she woke me up to go on the first day of the next week and I pulled the doona over and said, I don't want to go. And she (laughs) said, why? I said, you go. I said, you'd be a better CEO than me. (laughs) She's very organized. And she sort of snapped me out of it. But there was that sense of being overwhelmed. It's like, wow, the labyrinthal complexities of businesses. World Vision was a number of businesses under one roof. So it was a huge marketing business with personal sales, donor teams. It was an advocacy business. These are the challenges in the world. It was a highly technical international development business, libraries of books on how to do good international development that's empowering, that transfers power, that's community-based. You can get a lot of things wrong if your view is, you know, our job's just to raise as much money and send it overseas. (laughs) We have the answer called wealth. They have the problem called poverty, so we'll just transfer a bit of our wealth to them and they won't have a problem. International development's much more complex than that. So you had a whole lot of different businesses actually under one roof, and the complexity of that did challenge me. And being such a big vehicle with so much marketing, corporate and marketing power, you obviously had ability to raise huge amounts of money. Delivering that money overseas, like you said, would have its complexities. Was that the greatest challenge? Getting things done over there? Yes and no. In time, the greatest challenge because of the global financial crisis was the flatlining of donations. There was this, uh, after the GFC, turning inwards. Australians had always been optimistic and giving suddenly started to, giving started to flatline. So there was that challenge. From the early days in my first year, the Asian tsunami, which I went to, uh, Boxing Day tsunami, we raised $110 million in six weeks. There was this wind of generosity, but that turned after the global financial crisis. The challenge of programming overseas is certainly great. World Vision had wonderful partners in countries as a federation national directors in the African countries or Latin America or uh, Asian countries were very skilled people. So they knew local conditions, the risks of corruption, the extraordinary political pressures that can be brought to bear not to use the money well, to keep it away from military, from police, from politicians, have uh, forensic auditing, so reputation was our badge of honour, that money wouldn't be hemorrhaging. So we had the PwCs absolutely auditing everything we did. So yeah, that was a challenge. It was complex, but we had good partners. That was actually a question that I was going to ask, is going into such a big foundation, the challenges of you going overseas and being at the forefront of these huge international issues and tragedies and events... I would also imagine, though, back on the home front, the compliance and regulatory issues around keeping the charity in line would have been as stressful at times. Yeah. It was a huge organisation. No, it really is. Look, the compliance regime is necessary because Australians have a deeper version that if they have given some money, sacrificially given, and it's not used in the way they were told it was given, they don't give again. It really undermines everything you do. So, The compliance regime here is very important. I mean, there's complexities in it. Australians almost have been taught to think the lower the overheads, the better the program. It's almost instinctual. It's not that simple. Low overheads are a measure of efficiency. They're not always a measure of effectiveness. If my wife was sick and I needed a doctor and I started ringing medical clinics and said as my first question, what's the overheads of this medical clinic, and then chose the medical clinic with the lowest overheads, that wouldn't be smart. 
It would be smarter to say, my wife's got these symptoms. Do you have doctors who can recognise and treat these symptoms? I don't care what the overheads are because that's effective. I remember a donor saying to me, I'll give you a big cheque. I think it was $10,000 for a program in Africa, uh, but I want 100% to get there, nothing on overheads. I humoured him. I said, all right, write your cheque. He looks at me a bit puzzled. Okay, no overheads? I said, sure. He said, well... How are you going to do that? I said, oh, I'm just going to post your cheque to a post office in box in Africa. He goes, well, how will I know if it's used right? I said, oh, well, if you want to know that, you'll have to pay for it. So we have this nonsense at low overheads. Effectiveness is often quality management, accountability, forensic auditing to make sure, guess what, they're overheads. Okay, so you've been at the forefront of both local domestic issues and international issues. There's often vote of frustration at our government for spending so much money on foreign aid when they think that we've got all these problems back here in our own backyard. Is that a valid point or is... No, not in Australia. It's an embarrassingly ignorant point. We spend at the moment 20 cents out of $100 on foreign aid. Britain's at 50 cents, Scandinavian, Dutch, other nations are at 70 cents. We have given ourselves, uniquely amongst Western rich nations, a leave pass not to be generous. And the tragedy is that most of the world's poor are in our region. They're a long way from Scandinavia and uh, Britain. What, what happened after the GFC and the Pauline Hansen type message was, we don't have any responsibility for the world's poor. We've got poor here. We'll just look after ourselves. As if Britain doesn't have poor. As if other wealthy nations don't have domestically poor. It's not an either-or, setting the poor off against the poor, saying, oh, no, we can't help those poor because we've got poor. We never set the rich off against the rich, have you noticed? But we love to set the poor off against the poor and say, oh, no, we can't spend it on you because we've got poor. We can do both. We've always had the capacity to do both. The rich nation's promise since 1967 was to give 70 cents in $100, 0.7, and for their giving public to give 30 cents, making 1%. Australians and most other nations have all given 30 cents. Sorry, the private giving of Australians has been maintained very generously, that 30 cents. It's been uniquely the Australian government that's been mean, unbelievably mean, cutting their 70 cents commitment down to 20 cents. That's how low it is. And we then get the argument, oh, well, we've got poor, so that gives us a leave pass, as if other nations don't have poor. And who lobbies and campaigns the government for change on that? Me. (laughs) So I now head Micah Australia, and we're a lobby group on that post-World Vision. But look, the ACFID, which is the peak body for aid agencies, lobby. Others who lobby, so some of the big foundations that vaccinate the world's poor. Gavi is one of them. Global Action for Vaccinations. They all lobby saying, hang on, Australia. Other nations are giving their fair share to vaccinate the world's poor and stop diseases. How come you're the lowest? So, no, Australians, we love to say we're a fair, compassionate people, and that's been true of people in private giving. But we then think that must be true of our government. That hasn't been true. By the way, aid was at 50 cents in $100 under Bob Menzies. Aid isn't a left or right issue, and it's been whittled away since then. Menzies famously said, we will be generous, we will meet our commitments. He absolutely got that, that old fair Australia that we have lost. So you started the conversation about World Vision Australia where you didn't want to get out of bed. You weren't a great CEO. It was a massive step up. During your tenure there, you grew from funding 480 projects that benefited 10.4 million people to more than 800 projects. That's incredible success. Yeah, I'm very proud of that record. And there was a sense that even bumbling along uh, as CEO, and and this goes to uh, what you're looking for, I guess, in a CEO, traditionally World Vision, and most charities would say we want someone who's very, very competent in running the business. They took a risk on me. I wasn't a classic competent business guy, just didn't have that background. But I think I was particularly good at inspiring people to be their best selves, to look into the mirror and have a good picture to tell about themselves in terms of their generosity, their commitment. So I think that's where my gifts lay. 
And from having such incredible success there to stepping down from the role, just fatigue? Yeah, look, these jobs are just so full on. I had gone to every disaster in the world. I had lots of sickness, malaria and different near escapes. Yeah, I hit 60, 61 and it was just like this pace is just too much. Which is why I stepped back and did chief advocate for a couple of years. It was a different pace of being across everything. No one ever tells you when you become a CEO how many things you have to sign, how many letters, how many delegated authorities, how many meetings you're doing internationally at two in the morning because Australia's off Broadway and the rest of the world is waking up. It's just a really draining job. You moved on from there. And there's a couple of things I'll talk about between your journey from finishing up there to now. But what's your main foundation that you're getting behind now? So it's called Micro Australia. And Micro Australia is the Christian faith-based international aid agencies who are the members. So it's the World Vision, Salvation Army, Caritas, the Catholic, it's the Baptist, the Anglicans. And they fund us at Micro Australia, a small team. I'm the executive director to lobby the government on aid levels. So we've run campaigns like end COVID for all to get vaccines to the world's poor. Australia bought five times more vaccines than its population. As rich nations did, guess who missed out? All of the poor nations. So we had a campaign end COVID for all. We had a campaign where we united churches called Christians United for Afghanistan. So when Kabul fell and we got three or 4,000 out, uh, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, said, oh, well, it's a floor, not a ceiling. But then he didn't allow any more places. We ran a campaign for 20,000 extra places, Muslims under threat from the Taliban. We got, in Josh Frydenberg's last budget, 16,500 extra places the treasurer and the immigration minister. Alex Hawke rang me and said, well, it costs us $650 million. You've been a pain in the backside, but 16,500 places. We're running a campaign at the moment called Fight the Famine. So the impact of Russia's invasion into Ukraine is that the Horn of Africa is starving. 300,000 Somalians, women and children, literally going to die in the next month or so because Somalia and the Horn of Africa depended on Ukrainian wheat sales. So Micro Australia now runs campaigns and that's what I love doing. Outside of that, every year you address tens of thousands of people from both the public and private sector. You're obviously campaigning for a lot of things at the moment. However, what's your core message that you're trying to get across at the moment? My core message is that Australia can live into its picture of itself. The picture of itself is that we are fair-minded, practical, generous people. And whatever campaign I'm campaigning on, I'm saying to Australians, mind the gap between what we say about ourselves and what we're actually doing and live up to this, step into this, grow into this picture of a fair-minded, generous people. And you've been inundated the last few days with interview requests and doing interviews and all these sorts of things for gambling, advertising reform. Mm. I mean, you're across a huge range of issues, aren't you, in terms of lobbying and and pushing for change? I am. No, I take a briefing pretty quickly. I am able to organise and mobilise campaigns. I think I have a gift doing that. And yep, gambling is one of them and gambling reform. Touch on a couple of other things, because you are across everything, and I'd like to bring some recognition to some of those things. Are you still involved with any of these roles, and if so, in what limited capacity? Mm. And I don't mean we'll just touch on it. Chairman of the National Australia Bank's Community Advisory Council? No, I did that for 19 years. I'm not doing that now, but I did that when Don Argus was CEO, up to Andrew Thorburn. And so I really enjoyed giving away 1% of profit that NAB had to charities and communities. I did it voluntarily, so that was a great role. Member of the Australian Alcohol Education Rehabilitation Foundation? No, I finished up there, but that was saying let's limit the damage of fetal alcohol syndrome in so many, particularly Indigenous women. Let's get the message out. I, I love that role, but it has finished. Chair of the Community Council of Australia at one point? Still chair and still doing that. So that's the peak body for charities really in Australia. Chief Advocate of the Thriving Communities Partnership? Still doing that. Great initiative. Started out of Yarra Water, but lots of businesses saying 
with the poverty, cost of living rises, how do businesses actually have any for those who are hurting, who need a deferral in their payments and time and access to reorganising their finances? Pay, you're a patron of the National Youth Commission. Yep. Executive Director of Micro Australia, we've talked about that. Director of Ethical Voice. Yep. So I do a fair bit of speaking around the country and it's always around ethics. Ethics is really just simple word, us, not I, we, not me. How do we actually, corporate life, whatever we're doing, think about the we, not just the bottom line for me? What's the charities crisis, Cabinet? So during COVID, charities initially were left out of JobKeeper. Just didn't occur to them. So we formed a crisis cabinet. We met right through COVID, a peak body. We got into JobKeeper. We lobbied the government saying these are the people missing out. They had, you might remember, sort of ex-oil and gas execs running the COVID response, but they didn't actually understand the charitable world. They didn't see who was actually feeding the odds harvests, feeding the hungry. So that cabinet was very timely. Something that we did touch on it before, but something that's never relevant right now is spokesperson for Alliance for Gambling Reform. Hmm. You're, you're neck deep in that at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, look, we are. Basically, Australia has the greatest gambling losses per head of any nation in the world, 40% higher than the nation that comes second. And I'm saying we can change that. If America's blind spot is guns, the rest of the world looks at us and say they have been utterly irresponsible with gambling. With all of these things that you're involved in, and I was going to ask you this earlier, but I do think it's important to have your opinion on this. With so many charities now in Australia, and some of them do really, really amazing things, something like 60,000 mm. charities now. The Australians, you mentioned before that there was this real drop-off after the GFC. Mm. Is there donor fatigue in Australia at the moment? Yeah, I think there's donor confusion with so many charities. One of the things a community council we've done is actually organise meetings between CEOs of charities to talk about merging. If not merging, to talk about at least sharing back offices. And uh, why do we have so many, let's just take an example, charities for child leukaemia? Because it touches the heartstrings, but we don't actually need that many. They could be working together. So we, Community Council for Australia that I chair, believe that there does need to be less confusion less competition, more collaboration between charities. Will that happen? Yes. Look, the tricky thing is in the for-profit world, it's pretty clear. If you don't make a profit, you're out of business. In the charity world, the not-for-profit world, if you're not doing that well, you can still limp on with volunteers. And your identity is often set in, I set up a foundation. I need to keep doing this. So it's harder to actually do it. And when Shane Warne Foundations, uh, you know, put away Pat Rafter quietly, he retires his foundation, but blaze of glory, foundation set up, they're going to do this, going to do that. Most of them actually struggle. And in actually retiring them and putting them down, it has to do with personal emotional needs rather than actually really serving in this landscape very ably. Next question is how much of it's ego-driven. You've answered it already. In addition to your phenomenal work with so many boards and causes, you've also authored a number of books about life and faith. How passionate are you about writing? I'm more a natural speaker than a writer, but I've written seven or eight books, so I guess I'm a writer. <laughs> and I find writing a much harder discipline than speaking. I can give a talk almost on any subject without notes. <laughs> it just is the creative zone where I flow. People find their energy speaking's mine. Writing, I have to work at it. But look, I'm proud that I've written a number of books, a number that done okay. You've fought for, supported, fundraised and counselled for a lot of causes. What would you most like to be remembered for? When my kids were teenagers, uh, and I was already fighting the gambling industry and other causes back then, I remember my teenage kids saying, Dad, is there any campaign you've backed that's ever won? And I realised even my kids thought I was a loser. <laughs> I would like just to be remembered that I won or two campaigns. That would be enough. I've left most important question for last because you're involved in so many things. You're such an active campaigner. You've done amazing things right throughout your career. You've got Merity by your side, who happens to also work alongside you. You've got your kids. 
how have you managed to maintain any form of balance in your life <laughs> when it comes to work-life balance? So, look, I have had periods, certainly in World Vision, where I think I was getting out of balance and I was all-consumed and I hadn't worked out because I was passionate about the job, that a job needs off time and you're allowed off time. And there'd be guilt that I was living with that those people I've seen say in Africa, I'm their only hope. And if I can't raise dollars for them, they might suffer terribly, might even die. So I think there are bad times where I was too loaded with guilt. Now, I absolutely am able to say I'm not the Messiah. I can't do it all. I play tennis twice a week. I stand up and on my stand-up board and sup and paddle. I keep fit. So I think I've got a far better balance now. There were some years at World Vision where I think I was out of balance. I wanted to interview today to shine a light on you and the amazing things you've done, but also thank you from everyone that you've helped. We can't thank you enough. It's been a delight. Thanks. Thank you. A huge thank you to Reverend Tim Costello and to Meredith Costello for making today's podcast possible. Tim's generosity of spirit is extraordinary, and the community work he has done and continues to do in both Australia and overseas is incredibly inspiring. To learn more about the future of charities and not-for-profit sector matters, visit communitycouncil.com.au and check out our show notes for details. To learn more about the art of giving back in whatever way you can, visit our website, andrewpurdy.com.au and follow us on Instagram, The Hidden Philanthropist. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Philanthropist podcast, proudly presented by The Purdy Foundation. 